Okay. Uh, right. Um, well, good evening, everyone. Um, people, both those who are here tonight with us and those who are attending online. Um, welcome to tonight's book break. I'm Anthony Rowley. I'm a former president of the club, and I'm going to act as the moderator today. And it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's guest speaker, who is Dr. Yu Ching Singh, who is currently a professor of economics at the Graduate Research Institute of Policy Studies, or GRIPS as it's known here in Tokyo. And of course, he's also the author of the book that we'll be discussing this evening. And the title of the book, as you know, is Decoding China's Export Miracle, a Global Value Chain Analysis. Um, I put an emphasis on the, on the term value chain there because I think sometimes people are confused as the difference between a value chain and a supply chain. And if Dr. Singh will forgive me, I'll just uh, refer back to the first time I came in touch with this expression, which was 11 years ago, just after the uh, Fukushima earthquake. I interviewed um, Haruhiko Kuroda, who was then uh, the president of the Asian Development Bank here in Kasumi Kaseki building. And I asked him what, what really concerned him about the, the impact um, on Asia's economies of the um, earthquake and tsunami. And he said he was worried about supply chains. He used the word supply chains. And I asked him why, and he said, well, there are certain critical parts or assemblies um, that are made here in Japan that, where the supply will be interrupted in the wake of the earthquake. Um, and at that time, many people, including myself, as I said, had never heard of value chains or supply chains. Um, and now I think, you know, you can't, it's almost impossible to pick up a newspaper now or log into the internet without reading about problems or even a crisis with supply chains. Um, the terms, you know, are often used interchangeably and they're applied to anything from the anatomy of freight logistics to the process whereby parts and accessories for manufactured goods are exchanged between myriad different companies and countries for processing and assembling. Um, in that latter case, I think the value is added along the way, and this, of course, is what differentiates, I think, a value chain from a supply chain, where goods are simply passed from one point to another. Dr. Shing will correct me if I'm wrong there, but, um, well, Professor, Dr. Shing's book is about value chains, and in particular about China's critical and dominant role in global value chains. As he says in the book, um, in less than three decades, China has emerged as the world's leading export nation with exports in total worth two trillion a year. Uh, value chains have played a key part in this export miracle. Uh, so Professor, uh, Professor Xing is of course the expert, so I won't say any more that I'll leave him to pick up the story. Um, he's a professor, as I said, of economics at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Tokyo. Previously, he served as Director of Capacity Building and Training Department at the Asian Development Bank Institute here in Tokyo. He was the lead editor of Global Value Chain Development Report 2021, called Beyond Production, and his research on the iPhone and the China-US trade balance instigated a reform of trade statistics. Uh, Dr. Singh received his PhD in economics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign or Champagne in the United States. Okay, well, that's, that's a brief introduction, but I'll now hand over to him. Uh, he will take questions at the end of the presentation. So, Dr. Singh, please, if you would. Okay, thank you very much, Anthony, for your very kind uh, introduction. Uh, also, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to uh, discuss my book at uh, IFCCJ. Uh, specifically, I'd like to thank all the audience coming to today's seminar. Uh, as you know, it is a very difficult time now, not only because it's very cold outside, but also today I read the number, the number of infection in Tokyo rose uh, to more than 7,000. So thank you very much for coming to this uh, seminar. Uh, now let me uh, start my slides. Can you put the microphone just a little bit closer? Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, this is uh, the book I'm going to discuss today. This is a cover uh, of the book. Uh, <coughs> okay, uh, actually, I got uh, uh, endowments from uh, six very famous people, including Professor Richard Baldwin and the Deputy Director General of WTO, uh, Zhang Xiangchen and uh, senior fellow David Dollar uh, from uh, Brookings, Professor Etel Solin uh, Solingen from uh, UC uh, Urban, Professor Yao Yang from Peking University, and uh, Professor Han Rei Yun from uh, uh, National University of Singapore. Why, why doesn't I want? OK, uh, this book. Uh, includes six, uh, eight chapters. So chapter one is uh, introduction. So in chapter two, I briefly uh, review China's uh, uh, export miracle from uh, 1980 to uh, 2018. In chapter three, I explain first theoretically, theoretically how global value chain can uh, promote export of a country. Then I use uh, various uh, empirical evidence uh, to prove that uh, China's uh, miracle uh, has been driven by its uh, uh, active participation in global value chain. So in chapter four, uh, I discuss uh, the bilateral trade balance between China and the US from the perspective of a global value chain. As you all know that uh, the huge trade imbalance between the two countries has tri triggered the ongoing trade war. But if we examine the bilateral trade uh, balance between the two countries from the perspective of uh, GVC, we can find that actually uh, China's trade surplus with the US has been exaggerated by outdated trade statistics on the one hand. On the other hand, US exports to China have been under undermined. So if we use a new way to calculate bilateral trade balance, uh, the imbalance between two countries is not so extraordinary. So in chapter five, I discuss how global value chain um, have undermined the impact of uh, exchange rate, in particular the uh, exchange for yuan on, on China's uh, trade balance. So in chapter six, I discuss a policy environment uh, which has played a very important role for Chinese uh, company uh, to participate in global value chain. So in chapter seven, I use the Chinese mobile phone as an example to show that how the participation of global value chain uh, has facilitated the rapid growth of Chinese mobile phone industry. So in the last chapter, uh, I discuss about the uh, future trajectory of a global value chain because in the last four decades, China has turned into the center of a global value chain in various manufacturing products. But now, because of the ongoing uh, China-US trade war and the pandemic, so the global value chain uh, will be restructured significantly. At the beginning, uh, Anthony mentioned about you know the supply chain disruption. I think that concern you many. Uh, economists and the policy makers. So here I use uh, global value chain because uh, I'm an economist. So we care about uh, where the value added is created and who captures the value added. So basically global value chain and supply chain refer to the same phenomenon that is a production fragmentation geographically. But global value chain is relatively more comprehensive because it covers not only production process, or production segments. When we talk about, uh, you know, a global supply chain, for example, if we talk about supply chain of this uh, uh, iPhone in my hand, basically we care about uh, the parts produced, uh, produced uh, by you know factory located in different country. But when we talk about a global value chain, uh, we study not only the production uh, segment, but also who designed this phone, the research and development. Uh, of this phone, and also who distribute and sell this phone. So that's why, you know, global value chain itself is more comprehensive than supply chain. It covers a complete the value added. So when we talk about 
supply chain, basically we focus on the production segments, that is a production of parts, components, uh, assembling of this phone, that's it. Uh, because of time limit, so today I only focus on chapter two and chapter uh, three. So after that, I will you know, be happy to discuss with you about various questions related with global value chain or supply chains. Okay, before I uh, go into uh, the discussion of this book, I'd like to mention this uh, uh, working paper. Uh, this working paper was written by me and my uh, research assistant, uh, Neil Dieter, in 2010. So in this paper, I use uh, uh, iPhone as a case uh, to analyze the trade imbalance between China and the US. And we conclude that uh, the bilateral trade imbalance between the two countries has been exaggerated significantly. Because I use a case analysis, you know, for most of economists, they think case analysis is not a reliable or credible, it's just an indicator outliner. Uh, so at the beginning, uh, academic economists did not pay much attention to this uh, working paper. So fortunately, this working paper was read by a journalist from Wall Street Journal, uh, Andrew Bettison. I don't know any of you know him, so that's why today I want to mention his story. So after he read this paper, he wrote an article published in the Wall Street Journal called Not Really Made in China. Mm -hmm. That was published, uh, I think, uh, on December 16 of Wall Street Journal. Then after you know that article, then Wall Street Journal published another uh, uh, opinion uh, article called the six point five dollar trade wall because six point five dollar is a value I calculated contributed by a Chinese worker to the first generation of iPhone. The basic idea of this article is uh, uh, should the U.S. start a trade wall with China just because six point five U.S. dollar? <laughs> so because those two papers, you know, that made my research that this uh, article become famous and popular. Then after that, uh, academic, you know, uh, scholar started to be interested in my research. Then, you know, like uh, uh, the research in global value chain become a new trend in the fields of economics. So that's why I really appreciate, uh, you know, the article written by uh, Andrew Patterson. So after today's, you know, like a presentation, if any of you would like to write a book review, uh, I will be happy to give you a complimentary copy of the book <laughs> because uh, I think uh, uh, journalists are more powerful in disseminating the new idea to the audience. Okay, first I'd like to explain why I call the China's export miracle. I'd like to use a, a few stylized effects to explain the achievement of China's export growth in the last three to four decades is really uh, a miracle. Now let's look at uh, this figure. So in this figure, uh, you can see the export of high tech products of four countries, that is China, Germany, Japan, and the US, the four largest economy in this world. So if you look at uh, the export of high tech goods, of those four countries in 2007, China definitely is standing out significantly. You know, China's high-tech export in 2007 amounted 342 billion US dollar. It's much higher than US than that of US, Japan, or Germany. So in that year, the US high-tech export was less than 250 billion. So in 2007, China was the number one country in terms of high-tech products, not labor-intensive products. So by 2017, China's high-tech export rose to 654 billion. In the same time, the high-tech export of Japan, US and Germany actually declined slightly. When we think about 
China as number one high-tech export country, we should also keep in mind that China remain a developing country. So in 2007, China's GDP was only 2,700. So how come a country with a GDP per capita only 2,700 US dollar could be the number one exporting nation in high technology products? So definitely this kind of phenomenon indicated that this is a miracle, right? This is a miracle. So we're not talking about labor intensive products. We're not talking about today, okay? We talk about what happened in 2007 and after that. Now, let's look at, you know, the overall export of China, Germany, Japan, the US, same the four country. So here, the export of all those four countries are measured as a percentage of the world exports. So in 2000, in, uh, in 1980, in 1980, that is just you know the year China started its, ex its economic reform. China's export amounted less than one percent of global trade because China was a closed economy. It had been isolated with the rest of the world, and the Chinese government did not think about international trade as a source of economic growth. So self-sufficiency was a, one of policies before 1980. So. China was insignificant in the world trade. But by 2004, China's share as a world export rose to 6.4%, surpassed Japan. At that time, Japan was the largest economy in Asia. Then three years later in 2007, you know, China's share rose to 8.7% and bigger than that of the US, the largest economy in the world. Then two years later, China turned to the largest exporting nation, exceeded that of Germany. Still, I'd like to remember that China's GDP per capita in 2009 was only 3,800. So that basically means China was a low middle income country in 2009. But by 2009, China turned to the largest exporting nation. So that is just 30 years after China started its economic reform. So from a closed economy turned to the largest exporting nation in just three decades. So it is a miracle. Well, often we, you know, we talk about China. So many analysts and economists may refer to China's comparative advantage in rich, cheap labor. Therefore, it's natural for us to think that uh, China has been the leader of labor-intensive uh, products in the global market. But if you look at China's export in different category, you can easily find that China is not only the leading country in labor intensive, in textile and clothing, those intensive products, but also in high technology products. So this figure shows, you know, China's share in four different category. The first two category uh, indicate uh, advanced technology products, that is electronic data processing and uh, office equipment, which include the computers we use. The second category is telecommunication equipment, including mobile phones. Then the third is textile. The last one is clothing. So in 2000, in 2000, that's a year before China become a member of WTO. China's share was a 5% of global export in electronic data processing and office equipment. But by 2018, China's share rose to 36.2%. So similarly, we see the significant increase of the China's share in telecommunication equipment. So in 2018, China accounted for 42.3% of global export in telecommunication equipment. So in the textile and the clothing, 
So China's share also is the largest among all the countries. Now let's look at you know China and the U.S. trade uh, imbalance. It is very interesting that in 2018, China counted almost 50% of U.S. trade deficit in goods. So in 2001, China had 83.1 billion trade surplus with U.S. That is also U.S. trade deficit with China. But by uh, 2018, you know, China had almost 420 billion trade surplus with the U.S. That is uh, almost five times as big as that in 2001. In the same period, Japan's trade, you know, surplus with the U.S. actually, I de decreased slightly from 69 billion U.S. dollar to six. 7.1 billion US dollar. If we look at you know the total US trade deficit from 2001 to 2018, it rose from 422 billion US dollar to 874. That basically means during this period, US total trade deficit simply doubled. But US trade deficit with China rose almost five times. So often when economists talk about U.S. trade deficit, they think, you know, a low saving rate, excessive, you know, like uh, uh, consumption behavior, American household uh, should be responsible for the huge trade deficit. But my question is, why when American uh, consumers, you know, uh, spend their income on foreign goods, they spend most of them their product, uh, their income on Chinese products, rather than the products are made by Japanese company or made by Germany. And uh, some economists use so-called a trifling dilemma uh, to argue that US should maintain trade deficit in order to provide sufficient dollar liquidity. But my question is, why all the dollar liquidity provided by the US should go to China, or at least half of them should go to China? That does not make sense. Right, so the excessive concentration of a U.S. trade deficit into its bilateral trade with China, number one, that means kind of a miracle. Number two, that also remind us there's something else we have not uh, found yet. Then we should have the new theory to explain this kind of uh, extremely biased concentration of U.S. A trade deficit into one country. You know, in this book, I use global value chain to explain China's export miracle. Why? Because I think the conventional trade theory is not capable to explain China's export miracle. Why? If we look at the history of the trade theory actually is very simple. So conventional trade theory basically consists of the following four theories. Number one is the recording comparative advantage, which focuses on the productivity difference between home country and a foreign country, which simply explain the inter-industrial trade. For example, the classic close for wine trade. Then we have this Hector-Olin theory, which also emphasizes the comparative advantage in terms of a resource endowment. Basically means a country richly endowed with cheap labor should export labor-intensive products and import capital-intensive goods. So this theory also explains the so-called inter-industrial trade. So after that, we have so-called a new trade theory that developed by famous economist, Nobel Prize winner, Paul Krugman, which explained the intro industrial trade. For example, you know, uh, Japan exports Toyota car to Germany. Uh, on the one hand, Japan also imports BMW, Mercedes-Benz from Germany. So this kind of uh, intro industrial trade. Then we have so-called new new trade theory, uh, which emphasizes the firm heterogeneity, basically means large firm exports uh, 
to the foreign market and a small firm simply serves the domestic market. Why? Because this theory emphasized that in order to export the products to the international market, firms should invest uh, in marketing and uh, retail network or do the pr brand promotion. So for the small firm, usually they are not capable uh, to carry those kind of very expensive activity. Therefore, they can only serve domestic market. However, all those theories simply assume that the competitiveness of a firm in the global market is solely determined by its intrinsic comparative advantage. So why, you know, like a Chinese products are so competitive? So using this theory basically means that it be called China's comparative advantage. That's it. And they actually assume if a firm uh, wants to sell its product in the international market, the firm should do all the tasks in-house. Basically means the firm should engage in research development, product design, branding, many, uh, manufacturing parts, uh, assembly of those products, and finally uh, sell their products to uh, international consumer. But those assumptions are no longer valid in the age of a global value chain. Why? Global value chains now are a new mean of manufacturing and trading products in the global market. So what is a global value chain? So global value chain consists of a series of tasks which are necessary for the deliver of a product to the final consumer. So those tasks include research and development, product design, manufacturing parts, components, assembly activity, distribution, and the retailing. So all those products, the task actually performed by many firms located in various country, not firms within one country. For example, the, this iPhone in my hand, this iPhone in my hand. So in order to make sure, you know, finally, I can buy this iPhone in, in Japan. So there are many firms, uh, they finish the necessary task to deliver this product to me. So they are firm from Taiwan, firm from Germany, US, and from China. They jointly, they jointly produce this product and finally deliver this product to its consumer. Therefore, in the age of a global value chain, the competitiveness of goods in the global market is not decided by the comparative advantage of an individual country. That basically means, you know, China's comparative advantage alone cannot determine the competitiveness of made in China products. So if we think about, you know, made in China products available in the global market, actually, if not all of them, most of them are manufactured and treated along global value chain. This iPhone assembled in China. When this iPhone is shipped from China to Japan, it is considered as Chinese export. I believe this ThinkPad in front of me is also assembled by a Chinese factory. This ThinkPad, I think this is uh, belong to Chinese uh, uh, PC maker Lenovo. So this is uh, uh, made or assembled in China and shipped to Japan. So that become part of a uh, Chinese export to Japan. Now, let me show you some, uh, you know, picture about the made in China products available in the global market. Look at all the Apple's products. So if you have, you can check the back of your iPhone or iPad. You can clearly see a statement that is designed by Apple in California, assembled in China. But nowadays, because they use a very nice back cover, so it's not good to curve the statement on the back. So, but if you check the box, you know, this is an iPhone uh, Pro 13 I just bought uh, two weeks ago. Uh, that uh, designed in California by Apple, assembled in China. Statement is uh, printed on the you know box, not on the back. So here, this is you know the gap made in China. This is uh, 
H&M made in China. This is Uniqlo made in China. This is a slogan that is everything made in China. That basically means everything sold in Walmart are made in China. Then if we think deeper about the source of the competitiveness, all those products I listed here actually are technology, brand design, retail or distribution network, which have nothing to do with China's comparative advantage. Think about you know, those three uh, fashion brands, Gap, H&M, Uniqlo, because all of them, you know, have factory produce those products in China. That basically means in terms of production costs or labor costs, same, right? They have same uh, production cost. They have same compared advantage. Then when they compete, so the competitiveness of their product should be decided by non-China factor, right? Because all of three, have a lot of contract manufacturers in China. So basically means if we claim China's comparative advantage is a strength, that basically means all those three brands have that strength. Then how could they compete? Then they use design, they use their brand, they use their uh, you know, athletes to compete with each other. So those factors have nothing to do with you know, China's compared to advantage. Now I'm going to explain why global value chain can help made in China products enter the global market, can promote the growth of the Chinese export in the global market. So basically there's three spillover effects which benefit the firm participating in global value chain. So spill or effect basically means the benefit a firm can enjoy, but the firm does not pay. So the first spill or effect is related with the brands. Actually, all the consumer today, they are brand oriented. So when they go to market to purchase something, they already have the image about their products. Typically, that image are defined by the brand they like. So for consumers, brand means product quality and fashion. Brand represents the technology frontier. Brand delivers a social you know, prestige for the user. And brand can help consumer to simplify their routine purchase decision. Why? Because when you go to a supermarket or shopping mall, you see so many similar products. So which one you are going to choose? So brand will help you to make the decision. So if we look at the fashion market, so in the casual fashion market, it is a competition between Gap and Uniqlo, not between made in China and made US or Japan. So in the PC computer, it is competition between Dell and HP, not between made in China and made in Japan or US. So generally speaking, without a globally recognized brand, it's very difficult for a firm to sell its products in international market. So for Chinese company, so now I think we can see a few brands, but 10 years ago, there is no Chinese brand recognized by foreign consumer in the global market. So in order to overcome the brand barrier, so Chinese company can simply join the global value chain, which led by multinational company. They have globally recognized the brand. So once Chinese company join the value chain led by multinational companies, which have famous global brands, then the consumer's preference or demand for particular brands automatically translate into the demand for made in China brand products. For example, you know, when Nike shoes become more and more popular, then Chinese factory, which produce Nike shoes, they can export more shoes. 
when Uniqlo become more and more popular, then Chinese factory, which produce Uniqlo t-shirt and jeans, they will export more Uniqlo products to the global market. So the brand spillover effects is a main externality that have helped Chinese export enter international market. So this is the first spillover effects. Please remember, Chinese companies do not invest a single dollar in the brand promotion, right? But they benefit from the popularity for all the kinds of brands once they become the contract manufacturer of international brands. Second, spill oil effects related with technology and the product innovation. If we think about all the new models and the new products which are invented by multinational companies. So just think about all the high tech products since 1980, personal computer, the mobile phone, iPad, uh, uh, smartphones, right? All of them are invented by multinational company from industrialized country. Not none of them by Chinese company. However, any kind of technology products require not only core technology components, but also standard parts and the labor intensive service, such as the testing and assembling. Those uh, high tech products require battery, antenna like this keyboard or this, you know, LCD screen. So by specialized in low value added products in labor intensive tasks, so Chinese company can join the value creation process of high tech products and the benefit from access to growing global market and grow together with the multinational company which invented and designed the products. For example, all the Chinese company which provide parts for iPhones, which assemble iPhones, they grow together with Apple. As the iPhone becomes popular and attracts more and more consumers. So all the Chinese supplier of Apple, they will gain more and more market share in the global market. And they will benefit from the strong growth of this iPhone. Well, sometimes we may think the unit value contribution by Chinese firm may be very low. Yes. For example, you know, like in the first generation of iPhone, Chinese company's contribution was 6.5 US dollar. Yes, that was very small in terms of one iPhone. But if we think about the global market, so that will be very huge. So global market basically means huge potential for economy skills. Now I'd like to use two examples to explain the second spillover effects. A Toshiba, a Japanese company, invented a very small 1.8 inch disk drive. This disk drive has a size like, you know, one silver, one dollar. It has very big storage capacity, about a five gigabyte. But Toshiba's engineer did not know how to use this until Apple identified this disk drive was ideal for iPod. iPod is the first you know, generation of a music player. So in 2001, when Apple decided to launch his iPod, so Apple found that this disk was ideal for the iPod. It is small, but with a large capacity. So Apple paid 10 million US dollars for exclusive right to purchase all the disk, this, this, this kind of disk produced by Toshiba. Then a useless invention by Toshiba turned to a cash call. Why? Because of the invention of Apple's iPod. So similarly, you know, the, the glass 
the glass now we have for all the smartphone is called Gorilla Glass. This Gorilla Glass was invented by Corning Glass in 1960. That's a long time ago. But Corning Glass is an American company, did not know how to use it and could not find a market. So when Steve Jobs asked his engineer to find a very elegant cover that should be glass for its smartphone, then they found that the Gorilla Glass is the right one. Now the Gorilla Glass has been used in more than six billion devices. So you see, the two companies, they invented some products, but those products had been useless in their inventory for a long time. However, because of technology innovation of Apple, so suddenly the useless inventions by the two company turned to a cash call for those company. So this is a, a kind of a spillover effect of product and technology innovation by lead firm of global value chain. Here, the lead firm actually is Apple. The last spillover effect is related with the distribution and the retail network. Actually, if you look at all the global value chain, lead firm such as H&M, Nike, Walmart, Sony, and Apple, they are buyers. They are responsible for marketing and distribution in the global market. That basically means all the contract manufacturers should not be concerned about marketing and where to sell their products, even the Foxconn. I don't think any of you have ever seen the advertisement of Foxconn, right? Foxconn does not care where the Apple products assembled by it would be sold. So it is Apple which market all the Apple products, which market all the products assembled by Foxconn. For firms from developing country like China, actually it's very expensive and almost impossible to build up global distribution network. Therefore, when Chinese company join the global value chain, organized and operated by multinational company. So those Chinese companies are free of building distribution and the retail network in the global market. So those Chinese company can have all their products sold through established distribution and retail network by multinational company. So they enjoy the extension of distribution and retail network. That basically means when Uniqlo build more and more retail store in foreign country, then Chinese company, which produce products for Uniqlo, can sell their products into those country. Then those products turn into Chinese export, Then which shows that Chinese export enter more and more foreign country, eventually you will see the strong growth of Chinese exports. Well, I have discussed, you know, the three spillover effects and explain how participating in global value chain can boost China's uh, export. Now I'm going to use uh, empirical evidence to support my argument. Look at China's iPhone export to the US. In 2009, China exported about 2 billion iPhone to the US. In 2015, China exported 7.5 billion US dollar Apple iPhone to the US. So basically means, you know, the iPhone export by China to the US rose more than three times. From 2009 to 2015, Chinese workers' wage rose almost 100%, and the Chinese ran appreciate against US dollar about 10%. So those two factors basically means Chinese worker became more expensive than before. In other words, so-called China's comparative advantage in terms of cheap labor has deteriorated. But why, you know, China's 
iPhone export to the US could triple. Is this because China's a comparative advantage? No, this is because Apple's marketing and innovation activity. So you see, this is how you know the lead firms, brands, and technology innovation drove the growth of China's export. Well, this is just a simple products, you know, like because China exports thousands of products, you may argue, well, that's just one product. Now let's look at mobile phone. China has been the largest exporter of mobile phones. In 2012, in 2012, China produced about, uh, about 1.2 billion units of mobile phone in 2012, 1.2 billion. But China exported almost 1 billion. So that basically means more than 80% of China's uh, mobile phone uh, output was exported to the foreign country. This is in 2012. In 2012, there was no Oppo, no Vivo, no uh, Xiaomi. Now we know like of the top five uh, global smartphone brands, three are Chinese, right? But in 2012, there was no Oppo, no Xiaomi, no Vivo, and a few foreigner heard Huawei. But in 2012, China exported 1 billion mobile phone. Why? Because China had been the major assembly base for all the famous mobile phone brands. Nokia, before Nokia, bankrupted. Samsung, Apple, and other foreign vendors. Then those are foreign vendors of brand and technology facilitate China's export of mobile phone, not China's comparative advantage. Now let's look at, okay, I'm sorry, look at computer. Now let's look at the computer. We go to another category uh, for, uh, you know, information technology products. In 2010, in 2010, China's export of laptop computer accounted about 75% of global laptop exports in 2010. In 2010, there was no Lenovo. Now Lenovo is one of the largest PC maker. It has about 20% global market share. But in 2010, there was no Lenovo. That's number number two. Even today, the core technology of laptops or personal computer are monopolized by American company Intel, AMD, Microsoft, and Apple. So if we, we look at the technology that all the core technology of personal computer have been monopolized by American company, and if we look at you know the brands, top ten brands, only one belong to China. That is Lenovo. So why, you know, for each four laptop available in the global market, three of them are made or assembled in China because Chinese company assemble all those products for global uh, PC vendors. Okay, that basically means Chinese company which uh, export laptop computer, they are part of value chain laptop value chain led by foreign companies. Well, I discussed about two categories of products. One is a mobile phone, one is a laptop computer, still, uh, which may not represent, you know, a significant portion of China's export. But now I'm going to a very large category that is a high technology products. So high technology products now uh, account about one third of China's total export. So if you look at how uh, high tech export from China uh, are produced, it is very interesting. Most of them are produced as, you know, or products 
made with a foreign imported a foreign components. So we call that a processing export. So in 1997, in 1997, 80% of China's high tech products was produced in the form of a processing export. Even in 2016, still about 60% of China's high, high tech export was produced in term of a processing export. So processing exports are defined as products made with imported intermediate inputs. That basically means most of China's high-tech products are assembled with core components produced by foreign company. So processing exports are a subset of value chain trade. We talk about you know this global value chain that is a different company perform different tasks, right? So Chinese company uh, for making high-tech products, many perform those kind of assembling activity. So that's why China's high-tech uh, export grow so rapidly. As I mentioned before, even in 2007, China turned to the number one high-tech exporting nation in the world. So this is a secret of, you know, China became the champion of high-tech exporting nation. Well, if we go beyond of high-tech uh, products, we go into very general export that include, you know, all the products. So if we look at the role of processing export, it has been very important. Actually, in 1980, processing export in 1980, that is uh, uh, 40 years ago, Processing export accounted less than 10%. But in 1995, processing export accounted for 50%. What does that mean? That basically means 50% of China's export in 1995 was produced by global value chain. So in 1999, the share rose to 57%. So from 2000 to 2007, about 55% of China's export was produced in terms of processing export. That basically means products made with imported, imported foreign intermediate inputs. So if we look at the bilateral trade between China and the US, Japan and Germany, so processing exports, processing exports, had been a major form of China's export to those three countries because the high income countries are more competitive than low income country. So it's more difficult for Chinese company to sell their products in high income country. Therefore, using global value chain become a shortcut or easy way for Chinese products to enter those market. Well, you know, if Chinese exports do not include foreign uh, intermediate inputs or contain zero foreign value, how do they use global value chain? So here, you know, I use Walmart as an example because Walmart is a lead firm for what we call buyer-driven global value chain because Walmart has very extensive uh, store this is retail uh, the retail network not only in the us but also in many other countries so walmart has been a major importer of chinese products so most of products imported by walmart from china are low value added and labor intensive products so if we look at other you know we call this kind of a brand marketer or you know, wonder like Uniqlo, H and M, and Nike. All of them have many contract manufacturer in China. Those uh, company they produce shoes, fashions for Uniqlo, H and M, and Nike. They use all the inter intermediate inputs produced locally and make finished products. But those products are eventually sold by those brand owner in the global market. So in 2001, Walmart actually imported 
9.5 billion US dollar from China. But by 2013, Walmart imported almost 50 billion US dollar Chinese products. That is about 10% of US export from China. So you see, as Walmart continue to expand its retail network, then Chinese products can reach more and more American household. So this is how, you know, like a, a global value chain led by this brand owner and the big retailer help Chinese products to enter global market. Okay, now I'd like to stop here. So uh, now uh, I would like to uh, answer, you know, your question related with uh, global value chain or uh, supply chains. So here I list, you know, uh, a few topics. Uh, so I'll be very happy to discuss those issues with you if you have, uh, you know, like uh, uh, questions uh, related with the DVC and exchange rate, the global value chain and the China US trade balance and the global value chain and the, and the COVID-19 pandemic and other issues. Okay. Right, well, thank you very much indeed. Um, you've covered a lot of ground there. Okay, if anyone has a question, could you raise your hand, please, and perhaps go to the microphone over there and give your name and identity, please, and uh, ask a question. Um, if uh, I, perhaps I could just ask one question to begin with, which is, you you've said that you know that the si the size of the uh, trade deficit between the U.S. and China is exaggerated, and of course I'm sure that's absolutely right, and you've you've explained that. But how much does that matter now? I mean, the the trade friction between China and the U.S. now is based on not just on trade deficits; it's based on so many factors, security, all kinds of things. So, um, is this trade imbalance uh, really a th a th as much an issue as it used to be? That's my question. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, you know, like uh, at the beginning, I show you uh, uh, my working paper. That is how uh, <coughs> the iPhone widens uh, U.S. trade deficit with China. So I use the first generation of iPhone to illustrate uh, my point. Uh, it is uh, very simple if I use this, you know, like uh, iPhone to explain uh, about uh, uh, my argument. So when this iPhone uh, shifted to the U.S., basically, the, uh, you know, all the uh, components cost about 500 U.S. dollar, cost of 500 U.S. dollar. Then uh, Chinese or American customer officer will record it. This as you know, 500. Dollar, uh, China's export to the U.S. But of the 500 U.S. dollar, Chinese company actually contributed about like 100 U.S. dollar. So the rest of 400 U.S. dollar actually, uh, you know, uh, have nothing to do with China. They are the parts and the components made by Taiwanese company, Korean company, Japanese company, and the German company. Therefore. China's export to the U.S. is exaggerated. Because of that, China's trade surplus or U.S. trade deficit uh, with China is inflated too. This is one point. Second is, issue is more interesting. You know, Apple actually mm, sold about uh, 52 billion U.S. dollar products in China in 2018. In 2018. Apple sold 52 billion US dollar products in China. But all those products are assembled in China. They are not considered as US export to China. Why? Because those products assembled in China, but Apple actually made about 40% of the sale as its gross profit. That basically means Apple earn a handsome income from its brand design software by selling its products in China. Then the question is, 
should we consider Chinese consumers' payment for iPhone's brand, design, software as a U.S. export to China? Definitely that should be, but current trade statistics do not treat Apple's income from its intangible asset as U.S. export to any country. Let me give you another, you know, example to illustrate the issue. For example, Microsoft licensed its window operating system to Lenovo. Then Microsoft charged Lenovo for using its window operating system. So the Lenovo's, the Lenovo's payment to Microsoft would be considered as U.S. export to China, right? In the trade statistic for trading service. But Apple does not license its operating system to any company. And Apple actually earn the income from its operating system by selling Apple phone, iPhone, or Apple computer. Then the issue is, should Apple's earning from operating system considered as U.S. export to China? Yes, it should be. But current trade statistics are not capable to trace Apple's operation as U.S. export. So that's why, you know, significant portion of U.S. export to China, to Japan, and to the rest of the world mm -hmm. have not been recorded as a U.S. export. Mm -hmm. okay. There are many similar American companies like Nike, uh, Qualcomm, AMD, many of those I call that so-called factoryless manufacturer. That is an American company. They do not manufacture any products, but they own many products which are produced by contract manufacturer. So those factoryless manufacturers, they simply earn income from intangible asset, that is brand, design, operating system, software, from the physical products. But those kind of activity account a huge amount of value in the international economy, okay. economy but trade statistics are designed in a very, for very old-fashioned trade that mm. calls for, uh, you know, wine. Okay, thank you. Um, questions from the floor, please. You have a question? Yes, yes, gentleman here. Can you, would you mind going to the microphone here, please, and give your name, please, before you ask your question? No, that's not. Oh, no, it's on. Okay. You can take it off the stand if you like, if you're more comfortable. No, it's. Yeah. it's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's all. I, I'm not very impressed. Uh, my name is Gabor Shaprin from the Embassy of Hungary. And thank you, Professor, for the very interesting okay, lecture. Speak closer to the microphone. So I'm from the Embassy of Hungary. Sorry, announce. Uh, thank you, Professor, for this very interesting lecture. And thank you very much for the FCCJ for giving a uh, platform and space and time for uh, such wonderful uh, scholars. And I, I would have a few questions. One is, uh, I, I, uh, luckily I managed to get your book and one of your uh, argument is that China's rise and emerge as a number one exporter in the world is a very unique and extraordinary story. But I like to uh, argue that my question is, wasn't is uh, similar than the, Jap the rise of Japan in the 60s and the 70s, and China was, what I learned more like that China was adopted a lot and learned a lot from the rise of Japan as a, as a number one export uh, power in the world. And uh, uh, my other question is, uh, you mentioned that trade st traditional trade statistics uh, outdated are outdated and don't explain uh, present uh, trade relations between uh, major economies. So shouldn't 
the trade statistics just overhauled and 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 come up with a new method based on your uh, the G we see uh, approach and and and, uh, and an easy question uh, uh, you mentioned the made in China, made in the uh, labels on different products. And well, in Hungary, we have a joke: if it's not made in China, it's not real; it's fake. Uh, so, so, shouldn't this, shouldn't this labeling uh, replace by something else because it it doesn't explain the real thing anymore in today's very complex world? Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for a question. Uh, number one, I think a China model is different with Japanese model. So if you think about, you know, a Japanese model, Japanese company has their own brand, has their own, you know, technology. So Japanese company, I mean, not just individual company, if we consider Japanese company as a whole, that whole company within Japan, is basically domestically integrated. So they have their... Uh, own technology, so different f Japanese firm provide different components, they have their brand. But if you think about China, no, right? Yeah. So Chinese company uh, highly, real, uh, you know, depend on foreign brand, depend on foreign technology. Mm -hmm. So that's why the two models are different. So that's why, you know, uh, I think China miracle is different with so-called East Asia miracle represented by Japan and Korea. Korea also is a highly integrated, uh, you know, like an economy. It has its own brand and its own technology. Second, Uh, the income of generated from intangible asset. Nike, the same. Nike just, you know, market its uh, products, but all the products manufactured by company in China, uh, in Vietnam, and other developing country. So Nike simply earn the income from its intangible asset, that is a Nike brand and design. Mm -hmm. So the last question is, uh, you know, made in China. Made, made, yeah. Uh, uh, I think in 2011, the former direct, uh, uh, direct general of WTO, Pascal Ami, uh, he said, we should use made in the world. So after, you know, I published, uh, you know, yeah, after I published my paper, that is uh, the iPhone, uh, how the iPhone widens the uh, US uh, trade deficit with China, uh, with China, he said, we should forget about made in where. We should think about made in the world. Yeah, that's the case. Interesting point. Okay. Um, any more questions on the floor? Um, you made a very interesting point r right at the start, or near the start. You said that China is, is the center of global value chains at the moment, but, you know, because of US-China trade friction and because of COVID and so on, this is likely to change. In what way is it likely to change in the future? I mean, how is COVID and the US trade frictions going to affect China's role as the center of global value chains. Okay. 
You know, uh, we have this kind of analysis uh, about uh, the involution of global value chain. So the analysis shows that uh, China had been a center, important center of a global value chain from a supply side. Mm. But if we look at uh, the global value chain network from demand side, U.S. has been center, has been center. Yeah. Now, you know, the two center, one from supply side, the other from demand side, are fighting for a trade <laughs> war, right? They're fighting for a trade war. Yes. Then definitely uh, this uh, global value chain will be restructured. Why? Because about 250 billion Chinese goods exported to the U.S. now are subject to 25% tariff. So that tariff is too high. It's too high. So 25% tariff can easily wipe out all the profit through sourcing or manufacturing products in China for American market. So if we think about the impact of 25% tariff in terms of whole value, that is even higher. Why? As I mentioned, the products exported by Chinese company actually often made with parts imported from foreign country plus the parts made in China, like this iPhone. But when U.S. imposed 25% tariff on Chinese products, the U.S. customers officers do not care about whether the parts made by China or made by other country. So as long as all the parts are included in one product, so all the parts will be subject to 25% tariff. That basically means the parts shift from Taiwan to China, shift from Japan to China, shift from Germany, will be subject to 25% tariff too. So we have a, a terminology called effective tariff. So the effective tariff rate for the iPhone, according to my research, is about 100%. Therefore, the cost of the 25% tariff will drive many supply chain which serve American market out of China eventually. This is uh, number one. Number two, now the two countries, you know, uh, are fighting not just a trade war, but also technology war. Mm. So now more than 600 Chinese companies have been listed in the so-called entity list managed by the U.S. Commerce Department. Huawei is typical. So all Huawei subsidiary are on the list. Mm. That basically means Chinese company on the list can no longer purchase American technology. As we analyze, you know, in this uh, seminar, China's high-tech products are made with the core components produced by a foreign company. Most of them produced by American company. You know, like a CPU for the computers and the CPU for the mobile phone. And, uh, you know, this... Uh, of uh, uh, flash memory and dynamic memory are produced by American company. Now, uh, the US government even said that any company in this world should not use American technology to produce, to produce parts components for Chinese company on the list. For example, Huawei has designed its own CPU for mobile phone. This is called a Keelin series CPU. But Huawei does not produce that CPU. Huawei asked TSMC to produce, but a TSMC is a Taiwanese company which uses American technology to produce chipset. So TSMC has stopped provide, you know, uh, the chipset or make chipset for Huawei. So that's why uh, Huawei mobile phones market share uh, fell significantly. So this kind of, you know, like a technology decoupling that will cause a restructuring a global value chain. So in this case, that basically means Chinese company will find new sources of technology components or develop their own technology capacity for necessary technology components. So mm. last one is about COVID-19. 
because you know China has been a major supplier of various medical uh, goods which are needed for preventing you know this uh, infection uh, of COVID-19 mm -hmm. for example like a ventilator mask and uh, this uh, you know uh, material for medicine mm -hmm. so now I think uh, the US government and the many uh, government have realized that excessive dependence on China uh, to produce necessary medical products for uh, health um, of their citizen may have some kind of risk, in particular when the production in China subject to sudden disruption. Mm -hmm. So when more and more countries consider, you know, like uh, producing uh, medical goods uh, is necessary for uh, the health of their citizen, or they think some essential medical goods are important as energy and food, then we see this kind of uh, new uh, diversion from a traditional China-centered global value chain for making medical products. Okay, that's fascinating. I mean, do we probably is there a final question or, or have we no uh, well we are we are actually up against time but you know if I may say so you are a source of a, a mine of information on these things it seems a, a pity in a way you you don't write a more simple book for a wider readership because quite honestly as these are very important um, to, you know subjects for the average reader um, Perhaps you ought to consider that for the future. Or something. Okay. Yeah, thank Which, you very much. A mass, yeah. a oh, mass sales book. Um, uh, Morak Sun, are the copies of uh, Professor Singh's book available tonight for those, if there are? On the, at the front desk? Yes. Copies? For anyone who wants to buy a copy and have it autographed tonight, there are copies at the front desk which are available. Um, so please take advantage of that um, all right well tremendous thank you very much indeed it was it was very instructive and you know um, a, uh, I think we should invite you back again to to give the part two of this because some of the points you raised in your final points you know that um, the impact going forward what's going to happen from here I think that's absolutely fascinating um, I believe you already have an honorary membership from okay. Um, that previous appearance, but let me renew that and uh, in thanking you, uh, offer you this one year on. Okay, thank, thank you very you much. much for your, um, thank you.